You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have a great guest today, Thomas Hartung. Uh, he's a professor at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he works in what's called the uh, human toxome, looking at toxicology and other issues. Uh, he has many publications, over 450 publications, it looks like, and many years of work uh, in various fields here. So um, instead of me bungling what he does, I'm going to ask him. So Thomas, thank you for coming. Tell me about your work. Yeah, happy to do so. I mean, I made a somewhat unusual career that I left academia for a while. Um, I was a professor for pharmacology and toxicology in Constance, Germany, when I got the offer from the European Commission to join them and had an institute, um, which is the European Center for the Validation of Alternative Methods. Um, it is their place for promoting things which are replacing possibly animal tests and uh, validating them, so helping the regulators to decide whether they can rely as well on a method which is not employing an animal or is using less animals, uh, making the animals suffer less. This was a very interesting time at the Lago Maggiore in Italy, um, where we had a lot of impact on also the legislation in Europe, on chemicals, on cosmetics and others. But uh, I could not resist the offer in 2009 to join Johns Hopkins, uh, where I have um, a chair for evidence-based toxicology, and I'm directing their Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. So what is the big alternative to animal testing? Is that uh, organoids derived from human tissue, or what does it look like? Yeah, this is actually one of the hottest areas at the moment in uh, cell culture work. Uh, but you have to see, um, the idea to replace animal testing is not new. Um, but the technological opportunities have evolved dramatically over the last few years. Um, if you take a classical cell culture, and, um, and these methods are not really around very long, um, cell culture in the 70s and the 80s was really a very much you do it yourself type of activity uh, where you had to do each and every reagent yourself essentially. And uh, this is now a big business. There's companies uh, in this multi billion dollar turnover who are supplying the tools for cell culture. And um, from something which really looks like a pen fried eggs in a, in a pen, um, in, that's how cells in a petri dish actually are looking, uh, we have now moved away to something which is really reproducing some of the architecture and the function of organs. And we call them organoids. Very often we even include a perfusion like a blood perfusion um, and call them an organ on a chip. Um, so these are really the most recent additions in life sciences to mimic uh, human pathophysiology. Well, in your pan-fried egg example, it's the cell going from 3D, maybe spherical uh, shape to almost flat, you know, 2D. So I can see like immediately that's one good thing about organoids that are 3D versus just cell cultures. And then you have the, you know, you can enable cell-to-cell -cell communication and like you said, do perfusion of nutrients. Um, you can do all kinds of things. So what, what's kind of the state of the art for organized? What's a typical organized look like? Does it approximate all the functions and does it have all the cell types of a given organ or does it just do one? I mean, this is a permanently moving field. Um, it is, we are making a lot of progress, but you cannot say this is now the standard. Um, when I'm talking about these organoids, there's typically a few labs in the world which really have um, the best and most advanced technologies. But it's spreading very quickly to others. And uh, we see that articles about in describing how to do even better organoids uh, are mushrooming. Uh, all of the leading journals are full 
um, with excited stories about finally we were able, especially using human stem cells, to produce something which is really showing the functionality of a human tissue. And this is the one of the reasons why um, in vitro at the moment is is, is really booming, um, because it's really come something completely different. Um, a cell which is in a petri dish um, is having 50% contact to plastic and 50% to cell culture media. Um, there's hardly any contact between these cells um, because there's only a very very small rim of each cell which is contacting other cells and. Um, this has enormous impact on, on communication of cells, for example. Uh, the differentiation, they are not showing any functionality if they are flattened out. Um, the density of cells in, this, uh, in these conditions is only a, a tenth of a percent uh, of what the density of cells is in a normal tissue. What um, you know, I've learned recently about extracellular vesicles or exosomes, do you saying you don't see any, I don't know if, I don't know if you can even establish this, but cell-to-cell -cell communication appears to be absent in a 2D matrix versus a 3D organoid. Is that what you're saying? Mm, not absent, but much more difficult. I mean, uh, if you are in very dense contact to other cells, you have a lot of um, attachment opportunities, and uh, there's n hardly any space between two cells, uh, it's easy. If everything has to be uh, excreted first and dilutes into a uh, a large volume of cell culture media, um, the likelihood that your signal re reaches the next cell is very, very low. Uh, so um, cell communication is, is drastically improved if you have um, a tissue type of setting. And this is what these organisms are about. And they're typically um, a small cell mass um, where really uh, like cut out of a tissue. How do you construct the organoid? Is it 3D printed layer by layer? Or do you have an existing framework that you um, drop cells into? Like, what are some of the methods? There's, there's very different technologies which have to suit uh, different organs. Printing is um, certainly one of the high-tech solutions um, and gives you a very standardized uh, tissue, possibly. Um, but the disadvantage is it takes time. And um, the printer is only having a certain resolution. You can add um, certain number of cells, but you cannot really produce, mass produce uh, many tissues at the same time, for example. Um, there's also other systems which are simply self-organizing. Um, we, for example, ourselves are working on so-called mini-brains. Uh, these mini-brains develop from stem cells, and these stem cells are proliferating and uh, differentiating at the same time, and they form more or less uh, spontaneously with our guidance, they form organoids and they show some uh, architecture and some functionality of an embryonic uh, br brain of a very early form of a brain um, and the different cell types um, are produced by this growing cell culture. And in between are uh, quite a few different uh, types of devices where you seat your cells on different types of plastics, uh, different types of uh, biomaterials like the extracellular matrix, which is typically in between cells, and uh, you can generate very, very different looking type of uh, organ structures. What they have in common is that they are three-dimensional, that they're very often having the different cell types of the tissue, and that they are collaborating and are producing uh, some organ functionality. Are these organoids always sitting on a substrate, or can you do a free-floating one in a liquid? Um, and see how that's, it develops that's a, that way. That's a good point, uh, because uh, it makes a dramatic difference for a cell, whether the cell is adhering to some scaffold, so some plastic or metal or whatever uh, you're you providing, um, but the, or whether it's, it is free-floating. Um, in our case, we are using um, a shaker culture where we don't permit the cells to adhere. And as a consequence, our mini brains are perfectly round balls of cells. Um, and uh, we get them highly standardized by doing so. So the free floating is for us an advantage. Uh, however, um, any type of connection to the outside, uh, the outgrowth of, of uh, axons from the nerve cells is not possible in this setting. They can only communicate with themselves. They have no input, no output if you have them free, freely floating. What about conductance through the medium? Can that simulate communication with the uh, nerve cells? Yeah, the, the medium is is always a critical uh, point in, in cell culture. 
Um, what we're typically doing is we're adding cell culture media, which are very much mimicking the composition of blood, um, except for the cells. And then um, after a day or two, we are replacing them. In the meantime, uh, the cells have extracted all of the nutrients, the oxygen, and um, they have put in a lot of waste products, but also signal molecules. And then we typically exchange this after a day or two in a very quick and dramatic change. So they are shocked. They are really shocked by changing conditions um, in this uh, with this change of cell culture media, which is a big reason for why these cells need to stay very adaptable. They cannot really uh, terminally differentiate and be highly specialized because this requires a stable environment. We call this homeostasis. Uh, in the body, everything is extremely controlled. Um, the cells don't have a sudden change in temperature, in pH, whatever, because we um, maintain all of this in, in the body. Uh, so the cell culture media are really critical. And for this reason, some type of perfusion, which is allowing you to um, standardize at least the media conditions, have a continuous exchange or you're even recirculating these, uh, these media, make also a, a strong impact for creating a more physiological situation for the cells. There's a lot to replicate. I mean, you need the, um, the blood source essentially to be in a flow state. Then you have the termination of the blood and the movement through the interstitial fluid into the cell and then out of the cell and the electrical signaling and the, I mean, yeah, it's amazing all the things that go into it. Absolutely. And there's a, there's a lot to it. I mean, it includes a shear. Uh, the flow has, has an effect. Uh, it also determines really the size of the organ that you can produce. You know, um, in our body, every cell is only a few cells away from blood. Um, in cell culture, if you grow these things, you typically have only the fluids, the cell culture media, um, outside of the uh, organoid, which means that the center of a larger organoid does not get enough oxygen, does not uh, get enough nutrients, and we see very often that um, these cells are actually rotting in the center, these organoids. They are, we call this necrosis or apoptosis, if it's a more suicidal type of cell death, which means that the cells are healthy only on the outside um, in a large organoid. And this is where perfusion um, offers um, a lot of opportunities. But it's also technically very challenging how to get these little, little channels of fluid into an organoid. Well, how come it's not possible to have, you know, capillaries grow through the organoid? Is that level of structure just not achievable yet? Um, there's some uh, groups which are spearheading this. Uh, so we have some collaborations where people really try to develop vascular systems. And uh, we want to see how um, our brain structures interact with these. But that's exactly things happening right now in the laboratory. It's nothing I can uh, talk about in the sense of a success story. Um, but it's certainly a way forward. But it requires to bring people with different expertise together, people who are the specialists for the vascular system, and these cells are requesting completely different conditions than the, brain's, the brain culture. So we need to find cell culture media which are working. We need to find devices where our brains can accept to grow, uh, where they still get um, all, all of, the, of the nutrients. And at the same time, the endothelial cells and other structures of the, of the vasculature are, are happy. Um, but this combination of organoids or of all Organoids and uh, additional cell types, like also immune cells. Um, this is exactly the forefront at the moment. Um, there's more and more paper coming out now for two organ systems, four organ systems, and um, I think the record so far is uh, 10 organs for uh, one month uh, stably working together. Yeah, I was going to ask you about interconnecting the organoids and seeing the upstream, downstream metabolites and how that affects each organoid in series. Oh, this is uh, what we are only learning from uh, from current experiments. Um, people are talking about a human on a chip, um, so really a, a, a multitude of organs. It will likely never be complete, uh, but you have very dynamic, dynamic systems where uh, there's crosstalk between the different organs. Uh, there's a situation where, let's say, a, a liver organoid is going to metabolize things and uh, other organs are reacting to this. They're also going to condition 
their cell culture media in the sense that they are making them different over time. And this is a crosstalk certainly of, of, of various organs. And by doing so, I think we will revisit a lot of the our understanding of physiology and of uh, the interaction of different tissues. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was thinking about, you know, how, how people will say, oh, uh, alcohol is processed in the liver. So I was thinking that in digestion, food would come in and the liver would talk to the gut and it would, the gut would tell the liver, all right, send this mixture of enzymes that's tailored to what the contents of the stomach appear to be. So let's say the liver does that. And I may be wrong about this, but let's say the liver does that. Then um, stuff's digested, it goes into the bloodstream, and then it reaches the liver in a different form. Then the cells of the liver take in that material, they metabolize it, they probably produce their own metabolites, and now it's different yet again. And that metabolized stuff now goes out and exits the liver and maybe goes back into the bloodstream or goes somewhere else and affects other organs now differently now that it's been metabolized by the liver. Is that yeah. at all an accurate statement of the different things that happen? That's ab absolutely correct. Uh, you say it a bit simplistic, but it's uh, everything which happens to our body is a, is handled by a variety of organs. If you stay with the example of alcohol, um, you have your beer, you have your wine. Uh, the first thing is that um, this has to be taken up by the gut. Um, and this determines, for example, the kinetics. So how fast is this going up? what is the blood alcohol level you would reach depends very much on how fast uh, this uptake is. And then the liver is the first organ to really catch a lot of this stuff and it is converting it, among others, to acetaldehyde. And uh, it is not the alcohol itself, it's the acetaldehyde, which is then problematic for the, for the brain and is intoxicating us and is producing all of these side effects. So it is a matter of um, how fast is the liver dealing with this, how much of this acetaldehyde is forming, what are the levels now of this substance, and um, it is an interplay. And in order to mimic something which is relevant to humans, you need a barrier in the gut, which is taking up alcohol with similar velocity as it would do in a body. You need a reasonably sized organoid for the liver, which is doing the metabolism of the alcohol, and you need then also the possibility to get the acetaldehyde which is forming into the brain. And this is really a lot of, um, of fine-tuning until you have a relevant model. And you could actually say something about, okay, this amount of alcohol is problematic for, in the end, your brain function. In case of alcohol, so, we, we know, in the case of alcohol, you know, uh, we know this all from <laughs> millions of experiments done every day because we know... Uh, what, what alcohol levels are problematic. But you have to imagine uh, we're dealing with a lot of new chemicals, new substances. Um, in the US, for example, uh, about 1,000 chemicals uh, receive pre-marketing notifications, which means people want to sell them, put them into products. And for them, we have not experienced with humans. But we hope to have at some point the systems where we can do just the same thing. Uh, enter them in the system, see how much of it is taken up, how much of this can the liver handle, and what is still a possible impact on the brain in order to understand whether this is a chemical which is impacting on, on your central nervous system and its function. But this is a problem because even if you made like the perfect liver, it was exactly right, it still is not communicating with the other organs and it's still not, uh, you know, you'd have to look at, again, the metabolites it produces and then run that through other organs and vice versa, the metabolites from other organs, then run that through the liver to see, you know, to establish, let's say, cardiotoxicity or other stuff. So it's, it's, it just seems difficult because even if you get the, um, you know, the organ right, uh, there's still more to do. Oh, absolutely. And this is the, the challenge, but it's also um, the, an exciting time because, um, you know, over the last decades, we were typically going smaller and smaller. So we were, were drilling down, we were looking into, yeah, from what does the organ do to what is actually the cell which is responsible, uh, what is the genes in the cell which are changing, uh, what is the chemical conversion, so we're getting molecular. And in the end, we did uh, know m more and more, um, but we did not really, it was very difficult to go backward and say, what does it actually mean for the body? And now we are in a time where we are constructing larger systems. Um, it's a time where we are no longer satisfied with having a single cell in culture, understanding its role, 
but we want to understand the cell in the context of other cells. Um, so, for example, take a lung. A lung has more than 40 cell types, and it's not helpful. We cannot understand how the lung works studying a single cell type. And this holds for all of the organs. Um, now we're in a phase where we produce organoids with all of the cells and a proper architecture. And we're going a step further by saying, how do now two organs work together? What is the interplay between liver and brain? Or possibly then uh, a dozen of organs to understand really what is happening uh, with a substance for which we don't know what it is doing. So uh, these organoids are being used to test various compounds to see uh, their toxicity? Is that the main use of organoids right now? Let's say this is one use. Uh, it's a use um, which is very clear and straightforward, you would say. Um, also, we do have a lot of uh, traditional data because many substances have been tested in the past and we can very directly ask, are these substances showing the same effects in our models? Uh, to be clear, so far there is not a single regular use for any of these organic cultures for testing the toxicity of substances so that the substance can go to the market. But the vision is that this is only um, very, very few years away from here because uh, we do such an enormous boost to the relevance of these systems that it could be even better than an animal test, which we're doing so far, because it's a human tissue. And we're not 70 kilogram rats. And uh, there's a strong desire to bring these type of systems into our decision process also because uh, we don't have to make an animal suffer and it might be very much faster and, and cheaper to, to test in these systems. But it's not stopping there. Um, it is not only about um, testing toxicity of substances, it is also about um, modeling diseases. Um, so these models are really enabling technologies. Um, so for example, we have for our mini brain not only um, studies on how can we find toxic substances among the pesticides, the flame retardants, and the other substances in the world. But we also look into uh, how can we model virus infections? How can we model malaria and its effect on, on the brain? So we published, for example, just on, um, on uh, dengue and Zika virus and their effects on, on brain. Uh, we have, have projects on cancer. Um, so we grafted um, also, we brought in to our model glioblastoma cells, which is a very aggressive uh, tumor of the brain. We brought these tumor cells into the healthy mini brains, and we can observe how they grow, how they expand, and we can study treatment options. So the real important point is um, this is opening up at the moment with a new technology to study some very, very important medical questions for the first time within a human tissue. Yeah, I would think in looking at toxicity that you'd you'd have to really do a, I guess a gut organoid first, if there is such a thing, and then start hooking up other organoids that are that come after it, I guess in the cascade, because that's really what emulates what happens to us when we consume any food or medication, right? Unless it's directly yeah, sure. injected in the blood. Yeah. It's a um but you know, there's different routes for substances to get in. Um some are coming through the skin. Some are coming because we inhale them. Um, so you need different entry ports. And uh, very often it is, it is not the most difficult thing to study the entry because this is really um, a passage through a two-dimensional system. Um, but the uh, important things at the moment is to see at the end, is this substance problematic for the brain at all, for the liver, for the heart? Um, and, it, and we only need to worry if there is effect on these organs. And we need to worry much less whether they get into the body at, at all. But you can also do it the other way around and say a substance which does not make it into your blood circulation is not really problematic. If it's staying in the gut, okay, um, be worry less. And so wherever we can get some safe ground where we can um, anchor our risk assessment, um, we are happy to do so and, and say this is looking more problematic, this is looking less problematic. But like if I'm if I'm studying a medication, for instance, that's injected, I can see okay, there's a direct path to a given organ. But if I'm looking at a pill that I eat, you know, it, it has to go through the gut first. Do we even know what happens to various medications after they've been processed by the gut and now just start into the bloodstream? Never mind having, having been processed by other organs. Oh yeah, um, 
for drugs, we actually know this very well because um, you don't go into human trials even of, of, of the first drug without um, a pretty good understanding of what happens to these substances. Are they really taken up? Because, I mean, it kills your substance instantly if it's not taken up and gets in the bloodstream from the pill you're producing. And um, at this stage, when you do this for the first time in humans, you've typically spent already $200 million for the development of this drug. Um, so the companies are very careful to uh, to study in systems um, that the substance is, we call it bioavailable, which means it reaches the uh, the organism. And they're doing a lot of effort into um, optimizing that the right amount goes into into the human. And this is the type of formulation. You know, a pill is not just one substance. A pill includes a lot of things which are helping that um, um, that you control the uptake of the substance into uh, into the organism. And we also study then um, what happens to the drug if it's taken up. So you have a pretty good understanding what does the liver do to the drug, um, how does it get out of the body, what is the contribution of the kidney, um, is it going back into the into the gastrointestinal system and excreted with the feces, or are you exhaling actually um, the substance? All of this happens, and uh, it is part of the development process for a drug to have uh, to understand these things. And again, um, organ models are probably delivering better data here than um, the uh, pen fried eggs in the pen, uh, which I refer to uh, as uh, as how cell culture look, used to look. No, no, that's that's good. <clears throat> I guess there's still uh, really a long way to go, though. It's just amazing how how complicated everything is. It's really crazy. Uh, it clearly is, but. Um, what we see is that at the moment uh, we are entering really in a type of logarithmic growth in, in, in these models. It really has been a rare thing that people did study organoids in, in 10, uh, 15 years ago, uh, but the combination of um, advanced uh, bioengineering and especially the availability of stem cells, which are ethically not problematic, has been a very important point. Uh, you have to understand the um, it is very difficult to get human tissue, um, with the exception of uh, blood and skin. Um, who gives you a piece of his liver? Um, if at all uh, this happens as part of surgery, then these people have a reason for getting a resection of a liver. So they're diseased. They're typically old. Nothing is standardized. You don't get enough material. You cannot plan your experiments. Uh, next week, I want uh, a piece of liver. Nobody can plan. Stem cells are the solution to the problem. The first ones were embryonic stem cells, um, developed in only 1998, uh, but these cells were ethically problematic. Many people did not like the fact that um, surplus uh, embryos produced for in vitro fertilization, instead of being thrown away, were used in research. Um, but in 2006, um, Yamanaka uh, came up with a solution to this problem by producing a type of embryonic stem cell, but just from skin cells. So reprogramming normal human donor skin to become an embryonic type of cell with their consent, and then you can go the entire path of making this embryonic cells a liver, kidney, a heart, a brain. And this got the Nobel Prize in 2012, one of the fastest ever, yeah? only six years after the description, because it was such a groundbreaking development that suddenly in research, we have access to human relevant tissue. And this is really short on on, on time scale of research. Um, we we see at the moment an explosion of work with these stem cells being used for essentially every type of the life sciences because suddenly are we have people, tissue um, of high quality. Are, are people using so what kind of stem cells are being used? Like um, are they using liver stem cells to create liver organoids? Or are they just using generic stem cells from skin or fat to differentiate into all the organoids they want? There's a few um, different approaches, but the uh, leading approach at the moment is to start with so-called induced propotent stem cells, which is the Yamanaka method. Um, it has been varied by others, but in the end, it is about reprogramming. Some people now don't reprogram skin. They reprogram instead blood, uh, blood cells, or um, they even reprogram now from urine uh, the few epithelial cells which are in urine you can make them induce propotent stem cells as well. And there seems to be no real difference between these and others. And people are much more willing to give you a little bit of pee instead of a piece of skin. 
Um, so the accessibility of these cells is really is really enormous. Uh, there has been a sideline of uh, uh, of uh, fat tissue. Um, you can also reprogram fat tissue, um, but it's a bit more limited in in the tissues you can generate with these. And we're learning over the last few years more and more how do you produce the best brain, how you can produce the best heart, the best liver. Um, some of them are not yet optimal. Um, there's some limitations. But the progress is enormous uh, for just a few years of uh, scientific work. So what do you think the order of the progress is going to be over the next few years? What will happen first in terms of improvements and then what next and what next? You know, science is not uh, on a linear trajectory. Um, there's so many uh, scientists at the same time working and each and everyone is making a contribution. You can also not predict where suddenly certain things accelerate. Um, I see at the moment um, a big challenge to really have um, a finally uh, high-quality liver culture from these stem cells. Because at the moment, the livers I've seen so far are always a bit baby livers. They're not yet uh, the liver of an adult. And this is something which would really impact enormously because the liver has a very central role for uh, all of what happens in our body. Uh, and especially, it's a very central role for what happens to a drug. The liver is typically the organ which is taking up the drug and it is metabolizing it and making it ready for excretion. And um, because of the central role, um, I think uh, pharmaceutical industry, but also basic research, we all are, would very much like to see that the liver models are improving. Um, there's other challenges, for example, the kidney. Um, the kidney has one of the most difficult architectures and we have difficulties to produce, even with the availability of, of better cells, to reproduce a functional kidney unit. And there's some progress being done. Um, other organs are more easy. The heart, the brain, uh, are a bit on the forefront because uh, the heart is in essence a contracting muscle and you don't need to have the entire functionality to study it. Um, the brain is fortunately for us, uh, that's what stem cells want to become. Yeah? So if you leave them alone, more or less they're forming uh, some type of brain structures. Oh, really? They preferentially want to become brain? Oh. Yes, it's, uh, it's quite funny. Um, mouse stem cells want to become heart. <laughs> so you see a pretty spontaneous formation of heart cells. Um, it's a it's a bit... Uh, it, we, are, we are also not 70 kilogram mice, obviously. Yeah, that's hmm, very strange. So what's the best way for people to learn more about what's going on and to get a sense of it? Where, which, where can they go? Well, there's, uh, there's obviously a lot of places uh, which is uh, communicating science uh, from science journals for lay audiences to um, more and more events offering information. Um, our center, uh, the Center for Terms to Animal Testing here at Hopkins, is aiming to inform about such opportunities, um, especially with respect to what other technology which could possibly replace animal testing. Um, so we are really doing teaching, um, teaching which is geared towards scientists, first of all. Um, so we have made our courses on these topics also available for free um, via um, online platforms like Coursera, where now students all over the world can learn from us what we know, that we can accelerate the process, that you don't have to pay ten thousands of dollars at Hopkins to make uh, to take these classes. Um, but the um, there's also uh, communication uh, to wider audiences. So we are trying to bring this to um, conferences which are also geared towards science journalists like the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or European Science Open Forum. Um, we are also um, distributing this via web newsletters. Uh, we have a newsletter with about 8,000 subscribers, and uh, we are informing about things which are happening progress, uh, papers which we published, and all of this is uh, part of an effort to uh, communicate to people interested in science. And last but not least, uh, we are entertaining policy programs. So we have, uh, we're working with two people on Capitol Hill. Uh, we are working with a person in Brussels, the European Parliament, to tell policymakers about this progress so that they write legislation open for technical advances. Because very often, uh, law can hinder progress because if it is written into a legislation, this is the way to test safety testing, for example. Um, then it is prescribed and it's very difficult to change. Um, if they write 
bring the best possible information for what ha what how eye damage uh, happens or lung damage happens, then it is open for scientific progress because then it is up to the agencies to define this. And this is just an example for uh, openness to certain technologies, which very often comes via the legislation. So we were, for example, extremely thrilled when um, in 2016, the reauthorization of the Toxic Substance Control Act was prescribing to use wherever possible alternative approaches. Or we were very excited when some four weeks ago, the EPA announced that they want to move out of animal testing and want to promote these new approaches. So you see the agencies or the policymakers are really having a strong impact how the field is then uh, going in order to satisfy these demands. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Makes sense. Excellent. So, uh, Thomas, I appreciate you coming. Uh, any last words for people or uh, any other resources or is that plenty? Um, visit our website, uh, CAAT, the Center for Alternative to Animal Testing. There's a very rich uh, documentation you get a lot of information there. You can subscribe. Um, you should also keep in mind it's not only cell culture. There's also a lot to be said about computational methods, another area of our activity which we have not touched on, because also these are contributing in a very exciting way at the moment to uh, revamp how we do scientific research and um, how we minimize animal use. Very good. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. My pleasure. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.